Um, fine. <laughs> Sophie has just started recording us. Um, I can just see that attendees are slowly coming in. So wait a few more minutes until we have um, a good amount. Although there's already lots of you, which is very exciting. Obviously, there's great appetite for uh, the talks that are coming today. I'm very excited too, because even if I do say so myself, I have assembled a wonderful group of speakers and um, I think we're all going to learn a lot. Um, so I have a few housekeeping things as well to go through, but again, I'll just wait a couple more minutes um, until we have some more people here. Okay, so there's lots of us here, so I think we will just go ahead and get started. Um, as I said, for those of you who weren't here previously, uh, I'm Alison Garden, and you're incredibly welcome today for our event on academic opportunities after the PhD. And the aim of the day is really to demystify the processes around applying for postdocs and fellowships, because it can be really dependent on which institution you're at as to how much in support and advice how much support uh, advice you will get with your application. Um, I have a few housekeeping notes to go through quickly before we get started. So this session is being recorded and will be made available online after the event. The speakers will present in the order listed on the programme before having questions at the end of the panel, but you can send questions at any time through using the Q&A function, which is at the bottom of the screen. Um, I will be chairing, so I'll be asking these questions at the end. Um, if you would like to tweet about the event, please use the hashtag ECRDay2021. And if you're sharing an image of someone's slide, please make sure to uh, tag the tag or cite them. And I'd like to thank Sophie Cooper, who is here today for the technical support that she is providing. And also thanks very much to Queen's University Belfast and the UKRI from uh, the funding that enabled us to pay today's speakers and our technical support. Um, so this first panel is on uh, postdoctoral fellowships on projects, which is something that I think doesn't really get enough attention, especially um, in the arts, humanities and social sciences. So I'm really pleased that we have Sarah Common and Anne-Marie Foster joining us today to talk about this. Um, I'll introduce Sarah to you first and then we'll hear from Sarah and then I will introduce Annie or Anne-Marie and we'll hear from her. So Sarah um, is an assistant professor and Ad Astra Fellow at University College Dublin. Prior to this, she held an Irish Research Council postdoctoral fellowship and was an ERC funded postdoctoral fellow on the South Heron project led by Professor Portia Fermanis. Her publications include her monograph, Political Economy and the Novel, A Literary History of Homo Economicus, um, Early Public Libraries and Colonial Citizenship in the British Southern Hemisphere, which was published in 2019 with Palgrave, and Worlding the South, which is her most recent publication, uh, 19th Century Literary Culture and the Southern Settler Colonies, which was published with Manchester uh, just a couple of months ago. So I will pass over to Sarah. Thanks, Sarah. Uh, thanks so much, Alison. I'm just going to start sharing my screen. OK, 
Can you see that okay? All good. Um, so I'm currently in Australia, um, so it's evening time for me, but I want to begin by acknowledging that I'm currently on Indigenous land, and I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land I'm on, the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people, and pay my respects to their elders past and present. Um, sovereignty was never ceded. Um, so thank you so much to Alison um, for inviting me to be a part of this amazing event. I really wish I had had um, events like these to attend when I was a PhD student and starting off um, as early career researcher. So today I'm going to be speaking about applying and working as a postdoc on a project. And I was working, as Alison mentioned, on an ERC funded project. So I'm going to talk through the application process and sort of what I thought was really what I gained from working on the project and how to make the most of these sorts of postdocs. Um, but I just want to give you a bit of background um, from from my experience where I came from. So I completed my PhD in English literature at the University of Melbourne in Australia in 2014. Um, but I was highly mobile in my studies um, as an undergraduate and as a graduate. So I began my studies in South Africa, I moved to Australia. Um, I ended up going to three universities um, and I eventually landed up at the University of Melbourne for my, for my postgraduate degree. Um, and this mobility I think has been instrumental to me in my career. Um, it's something that people who, who will be speaking about the IRC postdocs a bit later might speak about mobility and how important that is for applying for postdocs. Um, but I also applied for numerous funding opportunities while I was a PhD student. Um, so I began building a funding profile very early um, in my studies um, because I like having other people pay for my research. And I like people paying for opportunities to go to conferences and, and, um, and archival research. Um, so I started building a funding profile pretty early. Um, when I finished my PhD, I taught um, in a teaching only position for two years at Trinity College Foundation Studies at, at Melbourne. Um, and this was a really, really heavy teaching position. Um, and during this time, I tried to turn my thesis into a monograph, but I didn't have much success. I was just really in teaching mode and I really struggled to spend time on my monograph. So that kind of stalled. And I wasn't really sure if I was going to end up in academia. I had applied for some jobs, but I didn't really have publications. I had one sort of chapter and edited collection under my belt. When I was doing my PhD, I, um, I was doing it during a time when it was still thought wise not to encourage students to publish during their PhD, which I would not advise now. I think it's really important to start publishing early. Um, so I just wasn't having any success with, with job applications. But I did apply for a Chawton House Library Visiting Fellowship, um, which I got. And I actually took, um, I used my annual leave because I didn't have any research leave or anything like that. I used my annual leave to undertake that fellowship um, in England. And um, that sort of kind of got me back into academia a bit more, into research a bit more. And then at the last minute, a mentor of mine sent me the job advert for the South End Project ERC postdoc, um, which I applied for really, really at the last minute, a couple, maybe a couple of days before it was due. And really surprisingly to me, I got an interview and then I got the position. Um, and so luck is something I'm gonna come back to time and time again. But um, that was like the first stepping stone for me, getting that, that postdoc. I worked in a team of four. So there was a, the principal investi investigator, Portia Fermanis, and then three postdoctoral fellows, including myself. And I used the postdoc to build up my networks, really increase my publishing and funding profile. Um, and I used it also to apply for my second postdoc, the Irish Research Council um, two-year postdoctoral fellowship. And both these postdoctoral fellowships, I think were like a crucial stepping stone to getting my current position, which is a tenure track position. So will hopefully become permanent. And I just want to speak about the realities of academia that sort of I've encountered um, before I go into the process um, of applying is that academia is not an even playing field. And I don't want to give a sense that you know, like a paint by numbers idea of academia, that if you follow these steps, you'll get um, a position or you'll get a postdoc because 
um, academia is so unfair. And as I said, a lot of my opportunities seem to have come from luck and just being the right fit at the right time. And I'll speak about how my research proposal really fitted in with the Southam project, which I think is why I got the interview, even though I didn't necessarily have those publications. Um, so luck has played a huge role in, in my career. And academia also rewards privilege. Um, so I don't come from a wealthy family by any means, but I did have a well-paid job at the time, which meant I had enough savings to be able to fund my relocation to Ireland from Australia to take up the postdoc position. And this is something I think we don't talk about enough in academia, that so many postdoc positions don't have relocation allowances. And so you're rewarding a certain type of privilege for people to be able to relocate. Not only could I afford to relocate, I didn't have any caring responsibilities and um, I didn't have any disabilities or illnesses that might stop me or make it harder for me to immigrate. Um, and um, I didn't have a partner who I had to worry about at the time immigrating with me. So, so these are just some of the things that I don't think we speak enough about. Um, I also took a massive pay cut to take up the postdoc position. Um, and, you know, I was willing to do that, but that is a sacrifice that some people might just not be able to make. You know, if you're looking after family, you might not be able to make that, take that cut. Um, and I also want to say, especially during COVID times, that I don't think we should underestimate how hard it is to move and to immigrate. There's this ex expectation in academia that we can just move countries at the drop of a hat or move cities. And I think COVID has really demonstrated, you know, how um, difficult that can be when you're separated from your family and your friends. So I just want to acknowledge these difficulties that you might face. And, you know, even if you get the position, you, know, you might not be able to take up the position. I think that's something that us within academia have to really um, work hard to address. So my preparatory suggestions for um, applying for postdocs, or any positions as you move out of your PhD, is to seek a wide range of mentors. And by wide range of mentors, I mean, sorry, let me go back. Um, by wide range of mentors, I mean, don't just focus on senior academics as being your mentors and seek mentors outside of your, <clears throat> excuse me, outside of your supervision as a PhD student. Um, senior academics are fantastic and they will give you certain opportunities, but they're not always up to date with what it means to be an academic in the current job market and to be an early career researcher in the current job market, which is why a day that Alison has organized like today is so fantastic because you're speaking to people who are still early career and who are currently working through this job market. And I think that experience is essential. Um, so choose a range of mentors, you know, from different institutions, from different countries, um, I have been assisted so much in my career through mentors that I've asked. Um, you know, I, I just approach people who I admire and ask for their assistance. And there's so much generosity from most academics and that generosity is shared. So I have received assistance and I wanna give assistance back. So I'm very happy to mentor people. So there is this generous community out there, which I think that, you know, we should really embrace. Start publishing, I can't stress this enough, start publishing during your PhD. And if you finished your PhD, you know, try to get a journal article out. Um, it really, it really helps for people, for hiring committees to see some sort of record. Um, they rely on publishing as a track record. And unfortunately, um, the days are gone when you didn't need to publish during your PhD and you could rely sort of on potential. Um, I think I was very lucky, as I've mentioned, about getting the position I got given the publication record I had at the time. Um, I think it's really important to build a narrative about your research and scholarship. And this is something I think I did do quite well in my cover letter when I applied, is thinking about what your broader research questions and interests are that tie the different strands of your work together. This is really especially important if you do interdisciplinary work. Think about where and how you're situating yourself in a field or subfield. And what is your contribution to scholarship? And if you are interdisciplinary, which is great, be sure that you're able to speak to each individual discipline um, because hiring committees are really um, conservative. Um, so grants aren't necessarily conservative, but hiring committees really are. And as I mentioned at the start, build a funding profile. 
um, and start early with small grants that you can get via your university, seed grants, um, grants that you can get via your um, sort of research associations, conferences that you go to, um, all of those sorts of things um, increase people's faith in you in being able to spend money and to be part of a research project and to be able to budget. They show skills that people on research projects really want. So how the ERC funded postdoctoral fellowships work is generally they one of two grants, um, either a starter grant, which is usually about 1.5 million euros for five years, or a consolidator grant, which is 2 million for five years. There's also an advanced um, grant, but those are, there's much fewer of those granted um, every year. And so these are allocated funding to a principal investigator, and they usually use that funding to hire a team of postdocs and sometimes also PhD students. Um, so it's project-based funding. You'll be working on a specific project that the PI has put up for a grant and been successful in getting funding for. And so you need to you need to streamline your research and your experience to meet the project's needs. Um, they usually these adverts are usually advertised around March or June, with a start date of September October. And so you must demonstrate knowledge and expertise relevant to the project. This is crucial, and I'd recommend that you research the. PI, the project and this, the institution extensively before applying. And this is something I really, really want to stress is that postdoctoral fellowships should be about developing your career. They shouldn't only be about completing the PI's project. They really are about career development and professional development. And you want to choose a PI and a mentor on a project that's going to help you do that um, so that you can leave your postdoc with the best um, skills going forward and opportunities going forward. So here I just have a quick example of the sort of advert that an ERC um, postdoctoral fellow might have. And this is for the South End project. This isn't the advert I applied for. This is the second round of postdocs that was advertised. Um, but I just wanted to give you an example to give you some pointers of what you might be looking at if you're applying for a project. Um, so this one is really helpful because by this stage, Porsche's project already had a website. So that's the first place you're going to go to in preparing your application for this project is you're going to do all you can to research the project. You're going to research, you're going to find out what the research questions are, what the methodological framework for the project is, what research case studies have, be, have already been carried out, where are the gaps that you could address. Um, this advert also really helpfully points out um, the key research um, areas of focus for the next two years of the project. Um, so you want, to, you want to use your cover letter to demonstrate how your research interests or your research proposal is going to address some of at least one, preferably more, of these research areas and demonstrate how your track record is going to speak to that. In the um, responsibilities, there's another few key examples of sort of skills that you should be addressing. So it um, speaks about that you'll have to contribute to publications of findings. So it's speaking about pu um, publications. So you need to demonstrate that you have the ability to disseminate. You need to have dissemination plans. Um, and um, publication plans that are achievable. Don't ever overpromise. Um, you also want to, it also speaks about organizational skills. And remember when you're working on a project, you're often working in a team. So you want to demonstrate that you have team skills, that you can collaborate with other people, um, that you might be able to collaborate in publications as well. Because even if you're not working in a big team like I was, you'll still be working with a principal investigator. So having team skills and collaborative skills are essential. Um, and it also mentions here speaking about training and professional development. So that's something you should bring up in your interview if you get to that stage, asking what training and professional development is going to be available to you. Remember, this should be a professional development position for you as well. So the process is dependent on the PI and the project, but usually there's two steps. The first step will usually require a cover letter and the CV. Um, so your cover letter should already be addressing the research questions um, outlined in the project advert. It should be, it should be speaking about your publication and your funding profile. 
what you can bring to the project and what the project can bring to you as well. Um, I think it's really important to demonstrate your enthusiasm for the project and why you want to be a part of it. Um, the second step, if you make it through this to the second round, is that you usually ask to um, sending a writing sample. So this could be a thesis from your chapter, it could be a journal article, a journal article, a chapter from your monograph, etc. Choose wisely choose something that speaks to the research interests of the project or at least the principal investigator. So my example was I chose my, the PI of the project was a romanticist. So I chose a chapter from my thesis, which was from addressed the romantic era, um, era. So it spoke to her research interests. It was also one of my favorite chapters. It was a chapter that, you know, that I believed in. And then you need to write a research proposal, which is related to the project. So you should have clear dissemination plans included in your research proposal, but always be realistic, don't overpromise, and demonstrate your ability to deliver, to deliver via your track record. Then you will be usually be invited to the panel interview. That will usually be part of the second step of the process. Some people might include that as a third step after the research proposal. Um, in the panel interview, you should expect questions testing your knowledge of the research area and methodologies, and you should be able to speak about your research proposal with real confidence and enthusiasm and how it will contribute to the project. Um, and make sure again of how that you have a narrative of how this ties in with your previous research with your PhD, etc. And always ask questions, you know, it's a way of showing your interest in the project. And I always say, don't underestimate the power of enthusiasm. I think, you know, in an interview, enthusiasm really carries through and it shows that, you know, you're going to be an, an interested coworker in the project and demonstrate your ability to work effectively as a team as well. So for my, um, I went, um, why is it not going back? Sorry, it's going forward. Um, for my um, cover letter, I found it recently and it wasn't particularly good, I have to say. I'm surprised I made it to the second round. But the things that I did do was that I immediately identified a research case study that I thought would get the interest of the principal investigator and want her to find out more about my research proposal. So I chose a catchy title. I said how it would address some of the, the research questions that had been identified in the advert. Um, and then I also built a narrative of how that tied in with my PhD um, because I was moving into quite a new area. Um, of research, but I wanted to show that even though it was a new research area, I still had the experience and knowledge and methodological knowledge in order to make that sort of leap. So yes, I was going into a new area, but I still had some experience in that area, it wasn't going to be completely foreign territory to me. So how to make the most of your postdoctoral position. Um, Remember that this should be a career development opportunity for you, and it's not solely about the PI's project. A good PI and mentor will want to support your development, ensure that you are highly employable at the end of your postdoc. And remember, this doesn't necessarily have to mean that you're going to be employable in academia, that you, that doesn't have to, you might not want to go into academia after your postdoc. So think about what other opportunities there are for you, um, professional development opportunities that would allow you to move outside of academia if you wanted to. I'd recommend having a meeting with your PI at the start of your contract, where you clearly discuss your career ambitions, what you want to achieve outside of the project, and what sort of career and development um, opportunities or courses the university might have available for you. So for example, at UCD, they have a whole professional development um, team for, for postdocs. Um, so you should be made aware of those opportunities. And your, your mentor and your PI should support you in doing that. And you might want to discuss whether your monograph, you're turning your, your PhD into a monograph, whether that might be a deliverable for the project, because often it is. You might often be hired on that. Um, the fact that, you're, that you, your developing monograph would be a key deliverable for the project. And if that is the case, and you should have time to do that, um, and if not, can you negotiate time to work on your monograph, which is what I did. So my monograph, my thesis was in a completely different area, um, but I negotiated a day a week and that's what I spent on my monograph and I managed to get my monograph out um, in, that, in that year. 
make the most of the research funds and project profile. So many of these grants, like an, ER, an ERC grant carries prestige with it. And, and you should make the most of that prestige. You're part of a team, you're part of this, you know, this grant that is supposed to bring new knowledge. Um, so you should really utilize that. Embrace networking and collaborative opportunities. Go to conferences and share your work widely. If the project is interdisciplinary, as it was the case for me, then make sure you go to different types of conferences so that you can meet academics working in different areas and that you can share your research more widely. Um, use the research funds that you get to travel widely, do archival research, etc. but also to organize seminar series, you know, use the prestige of the grant to invite those speakers that you would really love to work with, that you'd really love to, um, to, um, to speak to, um, and organize conferences and symposia. Um, use it as an opportunity to work with community groups, or libraries, or archives, etc. Um, give public talks so that you, you know, you're building a public impact profile as well. And also maybe consider creating a professional website of your own. There's often a website associated with the project, but you might want an individual website as well, where you can really sort of show your contribution, not just the project's contribution. So my experience during the postdoc is that I, as I said, I made time to work on my monograph. So I published my monograph um, in the first year of that postdoc. I developed the research case study that I had proposed for the ERC project. I developed that into a larger research project, which I then used to apply for the ILC postdoc. Um, so that got me my second postdoc. I used the postdoc to move into new research areas, which a postdoc can be a wonderful opportunity to do. So my, my previous experience was in um, sort of economic humanities, and I moved more into settler colonial literature, reading history, history of literary institutions and 19th century Australian literature. So I, I moved into sort of even more interdisciplinary areas um, and used the postdoc experience to be able to do that. I used the postdoc to apply for other research fellowships, so visiting fellowships at other institutions. Again, the networking really helped me do that. Um, I used it to increase my, my publication track record. So I published a journal article, I published a co-written book, I published a database as well. I co-organized seminar series, multiple conferences, and I built networks with community groups and libraries who are essential for my research. So that's been a real foundation for my ongoing research. And I received multiple, in, sorry, multiple invitations to contribute talks and publications. And that has been going on, you know, since I finished the postdoc, that connections that I made through that first postdoc, I'm still getting invitations to talk and to contribute to edited collections, et cetera, special issues. Um, so I'm still building my publication record from that initial postdoc. And I think all of these activities have been crucial to me achieving my current position. Um, so really thinking about how you can utilize the, the postdoc to make sort of reach every element of your um, of yourself as, as a well rounded academic so research public impact publications. Um, and then I also got some teaching experience as well, but you know I try to keep that to a minimum at the time. Um, so that's from me. Um, if you want to get in touch with me outside of today, you can feel free to email me um, and you can also find me on Twitter. So I'll just stop sharing and mute myself. Well, thank you, Sarah. What a brilliant way to start the day. I was frantically scribbling things down and sharing all your observations with those of us. Those who are on Twitter who can't join us today. Um, that was absolutely fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, delighted to introduce you to our next speaker, Anne Marie Foster, um, who is currently a visiting scholar in history at Queen's, um, but she's soon to embark upon a new and exciting postdoctoral adventure. Um, so she's going to talk about what it means to be a named postdoc on a grant application because there are on a yeah, on a grant application because there are slightly different ways of working on a project as a postdoc as one of the questions has flagged up. So um, we'll talk a bit about that in the Q&A. Another quick point on asking questions, could you please use the Q&A function to ask your questions rather than the chat function? That ensures that we can go through them all and tick them off when we answer them. Uh, so that'd be great, thank you. So to introduce Anne-Marie Foster properly, uh, Anne-Marie Foster is a historian of 20th century Britain with expertise in First World War studies, death studies and public history. 
She is an incoming postdoctoral fellow on the AHRC funded project Ephemera and Writing About War in Britain, based at Northumbria University, where she defended her PhD thesis in 2019. So if you'd like to take it away. Thanks, Annie. Brilliant. Thank you, Alison. Share my screen. Okay. So first of all, I would like to say thank you very much to Alison Garden for organising and to Sophie Cooper for doing the tech. Um, and to echo Sarah's point, I do wish that there'd been a similar talk as I was nearing the end of my PhD a few years ago. So I am going to echo a few of Sarah's points here, but hopefully not too much. And actually, hopefully that just highlights the areas of commonality between the two different types of approaches of applying to kind of postdocs. So I'm talking about being a named postdoc on grant applications. So in the past year, I've been a named postdoc on one UKRI application and two AHRC applications. So I'll talk a little bit about the differences between the two systems and then offer some general thoughts on the process. I would say from the start that this talk is probably a bit more useful for people who are still doing their PhD or who kind of immediately finished but hopefully if, if you're kind of further on than that, you still get something from this. So first of all, what is a named postdoc? So quite simply, it's a position within a wider team which wins funding. So instead of the PI winning funding and then finding a postdoc to work on that project, as a named project, you're part of the team from the pre-application stage. So you can either be brought in to work on the project application once the PI and co eyes have a fairly good idea of what the project is about, or you can work with the PI and co eyes to work up a research plan from the very start. PIs and co eyes are usually in permanent academic roles, which means that they have the security and institutional resources to apply for the larger grants that you're included in. And there's different kind of nomenclature based on the different schemes. So for UKRI applications in recognition of the work that the postdoctoral member of the team puts into the application itself, they would call you a researcher co-I, um, but the HRC just calls you a named postdoc regardless of, of the amount of work that you've put into the application. So as you can tell from my experiences this past year, there are no limits to the number of applications that you can be named on simultaneously. However, if they're all successful, you do have to pick one, it's like any other job. So, you know, you can't split your time between two projects, for example. So it's worth being honest with the academics that you're working with about other applications you're working on um, for very obvious reasons. Um, you know, kind of all of the, the people that I was working with this year knew that I was working on other applications with other scholars and they were all obviously absolutely fine with this because they all know what horrific state uh, ECR hiring is at the minute. So all of this kind of preamble uh, brings me to my first point, which is that these are still gambles. You are still applying for funding, um, albeit as part of a team instead of as, as an individual. So the funding that you apply for has different rules, depending on kind of what stream of funding you're going for. So for example, the UKRI bid I worked on was part of a specific call for funding applications on the theme of citizen science. So I was part of a public history team which worked towards applying citizen science methods to citizen history. We were working to a very close deadline, so there was a big push to work up a good proposal in you know, a couple of months, which is quite a short amount of time in terms of um, you know, grant applications. The AHRC grants aren't timed in the same way. Instead with these, you apply when you're ready, you know, when you have an application together, and then you get your decision after kind of roughly eight months, all this has kind of, though this has been extended in the pandemic. So my kind of one major negative, which I'm going to get out of the way now so I can sell you on the positives, is that these applications aren't guaranteed. There is still a lot of rejection in them. However, that being said, I will now go on to only positives. A massive plus point is that because you're working with other people, you actually don't carry the sole load for these applications as you do with individual fellowships or even for applying for a, um, a position on another grant, which does mean that you can work kind of up multiple um, projects alongside each other. 
So I, for example, I applied for these three named postdocs, but I also applied for an individual grant alongside them this year. But how do the timings work out? So roughly, as a kind of vague indication, expect a year minimum um, from kind of getting in touch with somebody about them or someone getting in touch with you about them to receiving a decision about funding. Sometimes this is kind of a longer time frame. Sometimes this is a bit shorter, you know, maybe 10 months, but roughly um, you're kind of talking about quite a long lead in. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about my um, specific circumstances to give you an idea of, of when I was approached and, and how that's kind of been shaken out um, as well. So I finished my PhD in 2019 at Northumbria University and went straight into a fixed term lectureship in public history. Um, in many ways, this was actually brilliant. You know, I had a wonderful 18 months of teaching at QUB, although like Sarah, this was very, very intense. Um, and although I know this day is about postdocs, I would say that both of us can probably talk to you all a little bit about the transition between teaching and kind of research because they're quite different approaches. And I think it's quite difficult to, to sometimes kind of change the mindset in terms of applications. So the real negative to my lectureship that I hadn't appreciated going into it was that because so much of my time was spent either teaching or trying to turn my thesis into a book, I didn't really set my sights on individual fellowships or indeed on longer term career plans. It was very much a case of just trying to get through. So I did get through to a, the final shortlist of Oliva Hume in 2020, but didn't get it. Um, and so I naively thought that I would just pick up another teaching role come September 2020. Of course, in hindsight, that was very, very naive. Over summer of 2020, there was a near mass UK university hiring freeze. And although I managed to interview for some few, some of the few jobs that there were, um, the positions went to people um, who were five years out of their PhD, as opposed to my one. So recognising the bleak academic landscape, over the summer of 2020, two academics got in touch about putting in as a named postdoc on projects they were thinking about. One of them was a mentor from my PhD days, who I've been planning to write an article with, combining our respective interests. Very much recognising the way that the wind was blowing for ECRs, she suggested that instead of an article, we write an HRC proposal instead to get me a job. So this was a kind of really lovely project to work on because I basically got to write my next project into a larger one. We worked on this project for several months, submitted in November 2020, had the reviewers reports in March 2021, which I'll talk about more in a minute, and found out that we were awarded funding at the end of May, and I start this position in September. This is the one that's been successful. So this is a project that I'm going to talk to you about in more detail in a moment, so I'll park it for now and tell you about the other two that were also running alongside preparation for this one. So the second person that got in touch with me was putting in a bid for a UKRI citizen science funding, which had a very clear September 2020 deadline. Now, I hadn't worked a lot with them before, um, but they had been my proposed mentor for the failed Leverhulme. I met them a couple of years before. Um, we'd met via another researcher and had been on a shared conference panel, but I honestly didn't know them particularly well. I'd maybe, you know, talk to them a handful of times, you know, three or four times really before they got in touch about this. It was quite a new working relationship and they introduced me to the other co-I on the project, so I hadn't worked with the other co-I at all. Um, ultimately, sadly, uh, the funding was rejected, although it was still a wonderful experience um, and I'm very glad that I got to work with them on the project. And the third person who got in touch with me was in November 2020. So I'd spoken at a conference that they'd organised in 2018 and they'd read my PhD thesis as it's available open access. We really didn't know each other very well again um, and they introduced me to again the other co-I on the project who I had never met. So we submitted the application in February 2021 and are still waiting for news about how it fared, although I've already politely told them that I've accepted a position on this other postdoc because it was the first to be funded. So for the second and third postdoc applications I was involved with, I really didn't know the PIs very well. And I came into both of these projects when they were already partially formed. 
I was approached with an idea and offered a chance to be involved instead of creating the project from the ground up. Both suited my research specialisms, one in digital public history and one in family history. Which brings me to um, my second major self and name postdocs. So if you're an interdisciplinary scholar or have research expertise in quite diverse areas, they can be a very good way of maximizing your chances for getting a job across different specialisms. Being brought into projects when they're already partially formed was also good in a practical sense. Um, on the UKRI one, I did more work than on the second AHRC, but nonetheless, it was much easier trying to partially write this application, knowing what my research parameters were. Both PIs already had a sense of what they wanted me to do as a named postdoc. So I was allowed to kind of add and suggest additional outputs and, and play with this a little bit, but it already was kind of quite a constricted framework that I was working within. That being said, um, certainly for the first postdoc that I was working on, postdoc application I was working on, I was perhaps a bit shyer than I would be now. I was so gratified that they'd asked me to, to be involved at all that I didn't advocate for outputs that would help my long-term career quite as much as, as I would now. So Sarah has already made this point, but I will briefly reiterate it here. So make sure that you make these positions work for you. If anything, you have more free reign um, than in the process that Sarah was just explaining. Make sure that you are getting your sole authored international publications, your public engagement work, or even your second single author monograph into the project outputs. Try and identify which gaps you have on your CV. You know, for example, my big one is that I want a second monograph under contract within the next few years. And try and work out if you can incorporate that into the proposal. You know, be quite forward in these discussions that you have with your PI about this. And again, this also works for Altac. So, you know, do make sure that you're thinking kind of beyond academia um, when you are trying to come up with these different outputs that you want to be included. The good part about kind of being able to come in at this point as well is that you can often arrange things like flexible working. Um, so I was quite clear with all of my PIs that I would not be relocating um, to the university that, that they were working at as part of it. And it was a conversation that you could have very frankly. Um, and again, you could build that in already uh, to the application. So, you know, you could arrange to have virtual meetings as a group team instead of in-person ones, um, et cetera, et cetera. So you do have a little bit more flexibility over how you get to arrange your career for a few years as part of this. Although, of course, that does ultimately depend on the PI. So all of this brings me to you talking a little bit more about the actual process of applying as a named postdoc and what this practically means in terms of time commitment to the application. So I was involved in one application which didn't take up too much time as I joined in so late. So I think I realistically only gave it, you know, a few day, hours, a few days um, to it over the course of several weeks. For the UKRI, which had that kind of very tight deadline, um, it took up maybe a week, a week and a half worth of working time, again, spread over those two months. And for the HRC that's been awarded and accepted, um, this did take up more time for me because of the, the kind of heavy involvement that I had with the application. And this is maybe kind of three to four kind of full working weeks over several months. In general, I would say to expect um, between three and 15 days of work spread over the kind of course of the preamble to, to putting the application in. Now, as anyone who's put in for an individual fellowship knows, this is quite good in terms of time sync. But do remember that all of this is running alongside, you know, your individual fellowship applications, your job applications, and a day job of some kind, most likely. So my CV looked quite similar for all three applications. I had four published articles, two research-based ones in quite good um, international journals, one collections review, and one um, invited overview of the field type of an article. I had another article under review um, and my monograph had been invited for full review of it to press, but wasn't under full review because I had not finished writing it. 
Um, I'd done quite a lot of public history work. Um, you know, I blogged for various big name sites such as the British Library and the Imperial War Museum um, because it kind of that big name kudos uh, does go some way within these funding applications. Similar to Sarah, um, I'd won a few smaller funding awards during my PhD, some of them international ones. I'd also been awarded funding for my PhD and had public engagement experience. I also had quite a decent amount of academic citizenship work, which showed that I could work within a team and had access to some networks outside of the organisation that I was applying with. Now, I don't know who's watching this and what your CV is like. Some of you will have far superior CVs to this. Some of you will not have this yet. For anyone panicking at this, I really don't think that you need as much on your CV as I did at that point. So for AHRC grants, you do need to provide a list of publications alongside your CV, which might be worth thinking about a little. But the more junior you are, the less is expected. What you do need to show with your CV is that you're a solid researcher with promise through some published work and maybe a small grant or two. But most important is actually your expertise and what you bring to the project in terms of your research knowledge and skills. The AHRC in particular places a lot of emphasis on developing ECRs through postdocs. So it's about being able to show that you have a research trajectory and that your skills will be enhanced through the proposed project as well as you bringing your skills to the project itself. Because being a named postdoc means that you're part of a team of scholars who are experts in the field they're researching. You're being brought in to complement and enhance the group. And in this respect, you're helping the broader team. Having a named postdoc on an application makes it stronger. So it strengthens it for the PI. It makes the funding more likely to happen because it shows that there's a cohesive body of people interested and involved and who already kind of have the skills and knowledge to make the project a success. So the application process itself was fairly straightforward. And in many ways, it's easier than applying as an individual because you don't have responsibility for the whole thing. So in this week's section, I'm going to talk about the project that was successful, as it's the one that I had the most input in. Um, so it gives you an idea of, of the kind of the maximum that you're likely to be involved in a large grant funding bid. So this is the one that I worked on with a previous mentor who's based in an English department and who also works on the First World War. I'd said to her that I'd quite like to work on a new research project about life writing in ephemera. So we started thinking of the ways that this could be expanded into a large grant. We're both interested in the memory of war, so she reached out to two colleagues, one a novelist and one a playwright, who agreed to use the ephemera I found to investigate how the received memory of the First World War, which is often largely focused on white male victims on the Western Front, to expand public ideas of war to bring in kind of hidden and, and marginalised histories. We later added another co-I and another postdoctoral researcher who were going to work on community creative responses to wartime ephemera to both intellectually expand the project, but also to get a job for another ECR. So my PI was and is absolutely wonderful and worked closely with me as well as the others to write up the proposal. Because our expertise was the justification for the rest of the project, I did spend quite a bit of time working on positioning the project within wider literature and articulating why our project was so important intellectually. I also helped write the data management plan and wrote my two work packages, as well as reading and commenting on full drafts of the rest of the application. So, for example, my first work package is to go and get ephemera for others to do their work with. I am the one with the First World War ephemera expertise, so I was given completely free reign to plan my archival trips. So I wrote the plan and justification of costs for those. My second work package will, I hope, lead to book number two. So again, I designed the work package, associated research and costed all of that. So in this sense, those parts of the application were very, very similar to individual fellowships where you have to design and cost your research plan. But on the whole, the application as a kind of cohesive um, thing, it was co-written and it was a genuine delight to help craft. I was allowed to be involved with the writing of it as a training exercise in and of itself. And because of my expertise in ephemera, which we're using as a lens to interpret literary representations and creative responses to war. 
So because of this, when we got the reviews reports in, I also wrote part of the rebuttal to their comments, again, um, in part because of expertise and in part as a training exercise. So for AHRC grants, you submit the full application, receive reviewer reports, then you write a response, which the board then considers. You're either awarded funding or not based on their appraisal of the project reviews and rebuttal. So the PI did do a good heft of the writing, as did other contributors. But the PI also organised everyone and dealt with university costings and permissions. So she did do a lot of the hidden work um, behind this, as did all of the people in the research and finance offices who helped us with the application. So in some ways, my involvement with these kind of big applications was the, the nicer bits of them. It was the kind of intellectual justification. It was the work packages. It was the kind of basic costings. It wasn't the, the kind of nitty gritty stuff and, and actually getting the application in and through, which is, as we all know, sometimes a bit of a nightmare. So what I really want to emphasize across all of the applications I've been involved with is the sheer amount of goodwill out there. There are a lot of brilliant people in permanent jobs who are doing their best to try and help ECRs when and where they can. I've been absolutely nothing but thankful for being involved in all of these wonderful projects and certainly working on them has helped my own kind of bid writing in different ways as well. So even for the um, projects that weren't successful, actually they've enhanced my skills more generally. The one thing that I wish I had known kind of going in is that you can push quite a bit harder for outputs that you want and need for your own career development. Um, so don't be afraid to be quite forward about this. And, and this is an absolute cliche, I suppose my top tip is to be good at what you do. Um, keep plugging away. Make sure that your work is getting out there. Present the odd paper, publish the odd article. And don't be shy as well to, to say if people ask that you are looking for work. All of these opportunities came from someone knowing about my work, which is how a lot of name postdocs are added to projects. So do keep plugging away. Do say yes to opportunities to disseminate your work and make sure that you're working towards your long-term career goals, as difficult as this may seem in the current climate. Thank you. That was fantastic. Uh, again, thank you so much, Annie. So much uh, useful information for everyone attending. We've got loads of questions you'll be unsurprised to hear. Um, quite a few of them are asking similar things. So I will just go through them in the list that they've come in. And then if you're kind of repeating, if I think you'll end up repeating material that you've said somewhere else, we'll just just dismiss it. Uh, not dismiss it, but we've already answered it. Um, so the first question we've got is from Lucia, and she says, thanks very much, Sarah. Uh, do you have a su suggestion for how many publications are a good number to stand out? And what about funding applications? And perhaps, uh, Annie, you can jump in as well um, after this. Um, it's almost like asking how long is a piece of string, I think. I think it's really hard. It, it often depends on who you're competing with as well. Um, I would recommend at least having one journal article, maybe two journal articles out. Um, you know, I think someone asked about this later on, so it might be address, addressing their question. Um, it takes so long to get journal articles out now. Um, the thing that I can recommend the most is always be completely honest on your CV, like absolutely honest about where you are, where you where you are in the publication process. So if an article is under review, don't pretend it's not under review and it's been accepted. People will know. So always be honest. I think um, in your CV you should list works in progress. I always do that. So it's under review. It's under contract. It's been accepted when it might be out, it's in press. I'm like absolutely honest about where it is. And I've people have come back to me afterwards, interview panels and have thanked me for being so honest. So it is something that they check is what I, is what I want to say. Um, for a postdoc, I don't think you necessarily have to have a monograph out yet. It would be good if your monograph is under review 
I think it'd be good to indicate that you've got the proposal out there and that people are reading it. Um, but it's not like applying for a lectureship where at this stage, unfortunately, you rarely need to have a monograph um, out. It can't be under review, it has to be published in general. Um, so, so, I mean, uh, um, Anne-Marie, you might want to come in here and speak a bit more. I mean, you, I, I've just been really honest about where I was when I got my postdoc. I had one chapter in the edited collection. So I think it was really what got me the job was really my research proposal was so, was such an excellent fit for the project. Um, but I don't think I would be hired under the current conditions, I have to say. Can I, can I just jump in here as well and say, to echo exactly what Sarah's saying, but also say, I think it is really different for different disciplines um, and different subjects. So we might have people here from a broad range. So Sarah is um, works in literary history and cultural yeah. history. So she's talking very much from a literary studies side of things. And also just to reiterate, I got my first postdoc. Again, I had one chapter forthcoming in an edited collection. So I didn't have anywhere near as impressive a CV as Annie did, but mm -hmm. it's very different for different opportunities. And um, yeah, just different opportunities, different subjects. So I'll, sorry to jump in there, hand over to Annie. No, not at all. I would say um, something that I've been constantly told is quality over quantity. So actually during your PhD, you, I, I wrote one really, I had one terrible, very short, article which wasn't in a very impressive um publication but I, I wanted something published um but the, the one thing that I really did try and write was I wrote one very big very meaty very you know I was trying to be methodologically sophisticated whether that worked or not but it did go into um a very good international journal and I was told that for hiring panels um at least in history and at least kind of at this early career stage that's what they were looking for. So instead of kind of maybe trying to desperately churn out two or three publications, which aren't perhaps, which maybe don't show your full range, right? Because you're doing other things and, and these things take a lot of time, try and focus on one really kind of flagship, almost publication that you say, look, this is the quality of my work when I'm given the time and space to do this. But of course, again, it's different disciplines, uh, completely different. Um, but that was what I was told. And actually, I'm pretty sure that that plus the um, teaching experience I had, that's what landed me my fixed term lectureship. Um, and then you hopefully have the space to at least try and get some more publications out there. Great, thank you, Annie. I've um, got an anonymous question here, um, which is it's a fantastic question, actually. What does it mean to write a research proposal for a project that is already undertaking research? So don't they tell you what to research if you get hired for the project? And actually, uh, Sarah, Annie, and I will have different experiences of working on projects because I'm running my own project now. So I have been recruiting a postdoc and it's a bit different to what Sarah and Annie have done. So Sarah, perhaps you might like to come in here. Um, sure. So absolutely was working on a project. So there were perimeters um, uh, to what I could propose, but there were research questions. The project was still under development. There re so it was right at the early stage of the project. They just got funding. So there were research questions that needed to be addressed, um, but I still had to put forward a proposal of how my research interests would tie into and, and my research experience and expertise would tie into the research project. So I proposed a small case study, uh, which fit into um, the project's um, outcomes and it led to a journal article, which was part of the dissemination plan of, of the project. So you still need to bring ideas to the project. Um, different PIs will have different limits that they put on. They might have a very contained project, but with an ERC grant, it's a five-year project, often with multiple teams of postdocs. Um, you are being hired to bring research interest and you know new research knowledge to the project. That's why you, you're being hired. So that's why you need to write a research proposal. So it was a two or three page research proposal um, that indicated some of the archives that are already found, some of the material that could be explored, the methodologies that I was using um, to show that I would be a good fit for the project and that I, you know, I identified it as a potential case study for the project that would address some of the research questions that the project had um, identified in their grant proposal. Uh, great, thank you, Sarah. So 
this project that Sarah replied to, she was asked to pitch a research project in FIT, as she's just explained, with the um, with the project's aims and research questions. Whereas I've just been recruiting for a postdoc and I have a very clear set of what the postdoctoral research fellow will be doing on the project. We'll be working together, it's collaborative, it's interdisciplinary, but there's quite a clear program of research in place that we will do together, whereas Sarah was asked to produce her own program of research in fitting with the project's aims. So they're slightly different. And again, Annie's experience as a named postdoc is also slightly different. So perhaps you might like to address your role, please. Yeah, so like I said, I kind of had two quite different experiences. I kind of, in one of them, the, the project was built around my kind of idea, my, sh my shared idea, the PI. And on the others, I was brought into it was a lot more, I suppose, um, it'd be like working with to Alison's experience um but instead of of someone kind of hiring me externally we were having these discussions internally um before the grant was put in so it was there was a much kind of clearer set of criteria that, that I was working towards so there was a lot less wriggle room um really great uh, thank you Annie I'm going to collapse some questions in together because uh, Lucy, Emma, Trishla and Sarah have all asked about how you found the time to publish both uh, alongside your PhD and when is a good time to start thinking about publishing in, in, with regards to your PhD, but also uh, Anne-Marie, you mentioned a day job. So how do you fit? And Sarah, you also talked about having really heavy teaching loads. So how do you fit your publications and your career progression around uh, all your other commitments? Um, yeah, it's really hard. And um, I, I just want to acknowledge that I wasn't doing any sessional work and I wasn't precarious in the same way that a lot of people are. And that takes a particular toll, um, which I think is even harder. Um, so I can't speak to that. That's sort of, I think it's incredibly hard for sessional workers to be able to do this. Um, so I can't speak to that experience. Um, but when I had my full-time teaching load, you know, I had 150 students and 10 like lecture seminars a week. I couldn't do it. I just couldn't. I tried it. I couldn't. I was absolutely exhausted. And I really struggled to switch between teaching and research. Um, so it's something I've had to teach myself how to do because my brain sort of gets fully focused on the one area. But what I did during my postdoc is I negotiated a day a week to work on my monograph. Um, and what I would do, and this is a tip that I pass on to other people, because it really, really changed how I worked, is that so I had every Friday that I would work on my monograph. And so I the last day, the last hour or two of Thursday, I would reread my monograph work um, and all my research about that so that on a Friday morning, I was ready in the zone. This is how I taught myself how to switch between teaching or a different research project in my own research. So that when I got up on a Friday, I could just already be in the book and in public, you know, in that in that sort of research mode. And so that day was a solid day. And I did that took me a year to do that a day a week working on my monograph and I got it out so that's what I did um, but you know I did have some time pressure off in that I had a two-year a two-year postdoc at that point but I did need to like ramp up my publications massively during the time and I knew I needed to get the monograph out otherwise I was never going to get a job um, so that's how I did it but I think um, Annie's experience would be quite quite different from mine um yeah it's really tough actually um and it's a lot of it is actually kind of building in habits um so my i was very very lucky that my doctoral supervisor was very keen on carving out writing time um and he taught me a lot about how to sit and write with very small chunks of time actually so he was a massive fan of the pomodoro technique which you can all go up and look and google um, so it does mean that if you only have a spare half an hour in the day or a spare hour, you're not faffing, you know, you're not trying to get into this headset, this kind of mind space of, of well, I've got to kind of try and ritualize my writing. You just, you, you kind of know where you are in the document, you sit, you write, you're done. Um, so that did really help, especially kind of when teaching uh, was very intense. And again, I think um, carving out time in your day. So again, deliberately saying this, this first hour of every day I will work on some writing and then you go and you know you write your lectures and all of this kind of wonderful horrific stuff which you also have to do um basically i suppose it's prioritizing writing so it doesn't actually get shifted too much 
although obviously during term time it is horrific. Um, so that's easier said than done. I don't think that I always stay to that. Um, I would also say that odd weeks of intensive writing are incredibly useful, especially when you're doing your PhD and actually even afterwards. So all of the drafts of articles that I've written have been on week long writing retreats. Um, normally they're done at the institution, um, but they can now be done virtually online. You can even do that um, within a group. Um, I think some of the attendees have been at a week long session that, that I organized um, at Queen's, but setting aside weeks to just say, look, that this is the week I have to draft something. And then you can kind of, at least you've got something that you can play around with in those little odd hours that you can carve out. But it's really, really difficult. Um, so I suppose kind of trying to build it into a regular habit and then giving yourself set times to try and desperately write up drafts is my advice, but it's hard. Thank you, uh, Annie and Sarah. There's a question from Emma actually about the finances. Uh, did you both forward plan for periods where you thought you might find it difficult to get a job or you might not have a job? Did you set aside money? Did you put in a place an action plan for that? Um, I saved money, but I've just been really lucky in that I've never had a period where I haven't um, been like on a salary. Um, so I, I've just been, I've been really lucky, but I did have, to, I mean, I did use all my savings to relocate to Ireland. Um, so, you know, as I mentioned at the start, like if I, if I didn't have that savings, I wouldn't have been able to take up the postdoc position. Um, but I was lucky in that, you know, I didn't, I didn't have a period of not having work. Um, yeah, I've been very fortunate with that. Um, I saved like, Matt, I really did save about half of my paycheck each month um, while I was lecturing be because of this. Although again, that's a privilege that not a lot of people have. Um, but I would say save as much as you possibly can. Um, Cause I did end up this year out of work for, for quite a long time and it was really rough. So I did use a combination of, of savings. I won some grants to do some writing, but I also, you know, I, I do have a partner who was in regular work, which did help a lot and again that is a massive privilege and I know it is so I knew that at the very most you know we wouldn't be kind of having to move back in with, with parents or something um if again you're lucky enough to have that option I knew that we wouldn't be homeless basically if it all um failed but actually the financial stress of that has been horrific and this is coming from quite a privileged position so save as much as you can plan for extra work to come in and again, I think you've got to try and work around that as much as you can, because it is very hard. And actually, this is something that we don't talk enough about. Again, you know, the, these kind of financial safety nets that we either try and create for ourselves or we have through partners or family wealth, if we're lucky enough to have that, which most of us don't. Um, but yes, it is very difficult. And I would probably do things differently now, knowing how rough this year has been, even with those safety nets in place. Uh, thank you, Annie. Uh, we've only got a couple of minutes left, so I'm going to try and condense a few more questions into one one. Um, there's been a few questions about where you find uh, postdoctoral opportunities and funding and how it's a great question about how can you build a network during the times of the you know, COVID times during the pandemic. Um, uh, Beatrice asked Anne-Marie about you being approached to be uh, a named postdoc, but similarly, similarly, I can never say that word. Can you also approach people about being a postdoc? So perhaps you could both just talk a little about your networks and how you find out about things and how you uh, how you get approached to and how, how you build those, especially in this difficult current situation. Um, sure, I think Annie might be able to answer most of these questions better than I can. But in terms of advertising for postdocs, uh, the jobs.ac.uk website is fantastic. Most um, postdocs are advertised on there. Um, as far as I know, that's where I found um, the postdoc adverts. Um, EOC um, publish their awards. So, you know, if you're looking in a particular discipline, you could see who got an ERC starting grant or consolidator grant, and you could expect that they would be advertising for postdocs soon after. Um, so you could look out, you could then go to their, their institutional um, 
um, advert and you know they're the institution's job um, site as well and look there um, there are a number of lists you can sign up for so there's something called research professional um, which you can you know identify your research interests and your disciplinary fields and then you get like a weekly email about different research opportunities including postdoc um, opportunities um, I think the other questions were sort of more suited to Annie so I might stop talking there Um, yeah, I always think that building networks is really hard and it sounds like I've had a really lovely easy time of it, but um, it's difficult, isn't it? And I think it's really difficult if you're not used to approaching people and you're not sure. Um, I'm always quite hesitant to, to approach people, though, like Sarah says, you absolutely should, um, you know, say, hello, I love your work. Can we have a chat? Or, you know, would you like to read this for me? Um, all of that. Um, but it is difficult. So I would say virtual coffees are a bit of a lifesaver you know you can kind of say to someone who's in the same area or interested in your work would you have time to have a chat um if that's a bit too forward uh there are loads of virtual conferences do present at them people are still attending people are still registering your work you may not directly chat to people afterwards but they're at least kind of aware of your name um things like that academic networks over covid often now have um, virtual coffee mornings. So for a lot of different societies, certainly within history, they have um, had a lot of spaces where you can go and you can quite awkwardly network over Zoom, but nonetheless, it's a face to a name um, and kind of knowing what you look like, making sure that people remember your name. Um, so what Might just, sorry, Annie, just stop it jump stop you there jump in there if that's okay sorry for being a wee bit rude no. um we <laughs> just i'm conscious of the time because you've got another session coming up at 11 and people will have to go find the link for the next session and log back in um thank you so just well quick five for i do my thank yous there's a quite a few questions about eligibility for postdocs and fellowships I mean, my advice would always to check with the funder because they often outline quite clearly who's eligible, especially when it comes to citizenship and questions like that. Um, and most UKRI grants, you should be eligible um, from wherever, um, but it's up to the PI when they're applying for the grant to make sure that they go through the funding office to make sure adequate uh, wage is put in place in the first instance and then other kind of costs associated with that, especially with relocation too. Um, so that's just something to try and keep on top of as best you can, although I know, appreciate it, it's really difficult. Um, so uh, now I'd like to say thank you so much to Anne-Marie and Sarah for their incredibly generous presentations and uh, so insightful and so helpful. And I know that the audience have really enjoyed it because we're getting constant thank yous from the audience. Um, for those of you who are coming to our next panel um, on a variety of different fellowship applications, the Marie Curie Welcome Trust and the Irish Research Enterprise Scheme, please check back for your Eventbrite email to get the right Zoom link to join us. Um, and I will see uh, everyone that's coming back in 15 minutes. But thank you again to Annie and Sarah. Thank you.